we are live. Keisha, ready to go. Over to you. Thank you. Welcome colleagues, we'll just give, uh, we'll just give it a few uh, seconds, maybe up to a minute for uh, the rest of the uh, participants to join the call. Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, hello everyone and welcome to today's media briefing during which we will launch the 2022 edition of UNEP's Frontiers Report. This year's report is subtitled Noise, Blazes and Mismatches, Emerging Issues of Environmental Concern. And it focuses on three key issues in, uh, <clears throat> in terms of environmental issues of concern, which is noise pollution, wildfires and phenological shifts. This is the fourth edition of the Frontiers Report, which UNEP first published in 2016, with an alert to the growing risk of zoonotic diseases, four years before the outbreak of the COVID pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, which we are still battling. My name is Keisha Rukikairi. I am the head of news and media for UNEP, and I'll be moderating this virtual press briefing, uh, which is one of the press events linked to the upcoming UN Environment Assembly in Nairobi, which takes place from the 28th of February to the 2nd of March this year. Now, before we get into the subject matter of the Frontiers Report, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping guidelines for you. Our program is an hour long, and we hope to use half the time for questions. Our panel today is a small but distinguished. Uh, representing UNEP's Executive Director is Ms. Andrea Hinwood, who is UNEP's Chief Scientist. We also have Mr. David, His Excellency David De Silva, Acting High Commissioner of uh, the High Commission of Canada to Kenya. We have Mr. Khaled Sami Al Abiyad, who is the ambassador and permanent representative of Egypt to Kenya. And finally, presenting the findings of the, of the report will be Mr. Martin Capel, who is the head of thematic assessments unit at UNEP. Media with questions, uh, we would ask you to uh, put them in the Q&A box on, that you see on the Zoom screen. Uh, you can start right away to submit your questions because many of you will have received the, remark, the uh, materials under embargo. When you do ask a question, please specify your name and uh, your media house or organization. The session will be recorded. And uh, without further ado, therefore, I'd like to uh, get remarks from uh, Ms. Andrea Hinwood, Chief Scientist of UNEP. Please go ahead, Andrea. Thanks, Keisha. And thanks, everyone, for joining today. And it is my pleasure to actually launch the United Nations Environment Programs Frontiers Report this year on behalf of Executive Director Inga Anderson. Um, we have some very distinguished guests uh, who Keisha's already mentioned. So thank you, uh, Mr. David De Silva, who's the High Commissioner and Permanent Representative of Canada, and Mr. Khaled Al-Abid, Ambassador and Permanent Re Representative of Egypt. And we have our experts, Dr. Martin Capel of UNEP, Professor Francesco Aletta, University College of London, Dr. Andrew Dowdy, University of Melbourne, Australia, Professor Marcel Visser from the Netherlands Institute of Ecology, he'll be joining us a little bit later, and Dr. Livia Moura, the Brazilian uh, Institute for Society, Population and Nature. So UNEP has a mandate to keep the global environment under review, and we address legacy, current and future environmental issues using science to inform decision making to address the three planetary crises of which you are all aware, climate change, loss of biodiversity and nature, and of course, pollution and waste. Our Frontiers Report series aims to put the spotlight on key and emerging environmental issues. 
those that potentially have huge effects on our society, economy and ecosystems. So in this report, we're drawing attention to three issues of growing concern, noise in our cities, wildfires under climate change and phenology shifting the rhythm of nature. Each of these issues has significant impacts on the environment and human health. And we need to be aware of the issues, their causes, so we can actually look at how we manage them, prevent harm and implement appropriate preventative actions and solutions. I think all of us understand the impact of noise in particular. We've all experienced annoyance, annoyance at one time or another. We've also experienced sounds that bring joy to us, such as listening to bird song or the sounds of a forest, or if you like music, the pleasure and power that music can bring to us and that actually transcends time, space and sound itself. But in our cities where more than 50% of our populations live, we've got numerous sources of noise, such as industry, construction, traffic and roadworks, railways, and of course, as our cities expand, which they are, noise is an increasing issue for people who live in them. Noise increases the risk of cardiovascular events in some individuals. It can actually increase the risks of poor mental health and well-being. And studies have shown that there are impacts on children's development and cognitive skills when exposed to too much noise. Equally, birds, insects and other species, even hearing fish and marine mammals are affected by, by noise. I think what's interesting about these issues is that there are many ways of decreasing noise and improving soundscapes for environmental and human health benefits. And our Frontiers report talks about some of that. Wildfires over the past few years have been devastating. I think we've all witnessed the uh, horrific scenes from a wide variety of countries. And of course, they're expected to increase in frequency and intensity with climate change. Areas that are not traditionally burned are now burning. And we're witnessing the distressing impacts on biodiversity and of course the impacts on human health with loss of homes and livelihoods and the inevitable smoke, which is blanketing populations and also being transported many kilometers away. Fire has always been part of life, depending on where you live, but the increasing frequency and area being burned, and of course the intensity is stretching resources and Following a fire, the recovery operations are taking years. Fires also produce greenhouse gases in large quantities, further contributing to climate change in a feedback loop. So the more we actually change the climate, the more we have fires, the more we're actually reinforcing that particular cycle. The third issue that we're targeting in our Frontiers report today deals with shifts in phenology, where many animals and plants use factors such as temperature or rain or day length as a cue for their next stage in their life cycle. For example, shortened day length and lower temperature in autumn prompts the eastern monarch butterfly in North America to fly south. But our scientific studies have shown that delayed migration of the butterfly has occurred by six days. Doesn't sound like much, but due to those warmer temperatures, it affects their access to food, it affects breeding and of course, resilience of the species, which then has flow on effects for other ecosystems. These phenology shifts are already measurable, but we're hoping that we've improved knowledge and focus on this, that we can actually look at our management approaches. And of course, the key issue here is to take urgent action to address climate change. These issues may not seem like they're interrelated, but many of the sources of noise, fire, um, and the impacts of climate change on phenology all impact on other facets. And so if we actually deal with the environmental dimension across these different areas, we have a great hope of actually solving multiple issues. So the three issues today can be addressed as long as we acknowledge them and commit to effectively plan. And of course, we need to make sure that we plan for managing our ecosystems faced with shifting cues, that we retain and restore habitat, that we create biological corridors, and of course, that we urgently address climate change and that we plan in our cities to restore, to put vegetation back and to reduce sources of noise. So I look forward to hearing from our esteemed panel today, and I encourage everyone to be informed on these issues and consider the solutions to ensure a positive and healthy planet. Thank you all, and I'll pass you back no. to our moderator. Thank you very much, Andrea.
We, uh, can we can we move on to Mr. David De Silva, um, His Excellency, Acting High Commissioner to of, of uh, Canada to Kenya. Welcome, Excellency. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the Executive Director and UNEP's Chief Scientist Hinwood for inviting Canada to speak at this event on phenological shifts caused by climate change. Though I'm a diplomat, and so therefore I work on largely ephemeral uh, social science issues, I've always been interested in the harder sciences and its interaction with people. It was only in university that I had to make some hard choices about taking less biology and less, less hard natural sciences um, in order to, to move on with my career. So it's been a passion for me in school and an area where I've tried to do my part um, personally, but also in my professional life on behalf of Canada to make a difference. And this is why I, I find UNEP's work so fascinating and frankly, so utterly important. Um, UNEP is translating scientific evidence into bite-sized morsels through this report, digestible for, well, frankly, political actors like me, so that us political folk and, and the average citizen can join scientists in collectively fighting to save the only planet that we get to call home. This year's Frontiers report, frankly, is striking. It is yet further proof of the relevance of UNEP and the work at the science policy interface right here and right now to inform delegates as they gather for the UN Environment Assembly coming up. Canada is well referenced in this new report, not only with examples of how climate change affects the monarch butterfly, as mentioned, or the migration of whales, but also sadly regarding studies on noise levels in a city like my hometown of Toronto or wildfires that we in Canada are experiencing more and more. Now, allow me to share a few examples from back home that scientists from our Ministry of Environment and Climate Change have provided of how climate change affects our wildlife and flora. The implications of climate change and other threats to nature are already widely felt. Extinctions are occurring at 1,000 times the natural background rate with more than 1 million species facing risk of extinction globally. In Canada, we have over 600 species that are formally listed as species at risk, many owing in part to risks from a changing climate. Probably the best indications of climate-induced advancements in spring phenology in Southern Canada come from a nifty community-based citizen science program that started in the province of Alberta way back in 1936. Early flowering plants in a study advanced their emergence by approximately two weeks between 1936 and 2006, while late flowering plants advanced their emergence by up to six days. As Chief Scientist Hinwood put, put it, this might not sound like a lot, but actually, but phenomenal change is occurring at the scale of ecosystems. The Arctic is warming at a greater rate than other places on Earth. And so spring is arriving up to two weeks earlier in some areas compared to three or four decades ago. Research findings suggest that a loss of sea ice conditions in the Canadian Arctic caused by climate change is altering predator-prey dynamics and causing a suite of cascade effects. We can see this in our natural effects, but also the effect that it's having on local populations that depend on some of the animals in these areas. For example, polar bears are found preying more and more on land and earlier than before because sea ice is no longer available. And therefore, they prey on eggs in colonies of birds. The timing of the breeding of these birds has shifted as well, but not necessarily by the same amount. And so the bear's early presence on land eating the eggs of these birds can have devastating effects for these colonies. This in turn is leading to cascading ecological impacts elsewhere in our Arctic ecosystems. Another example, Canadian research suggests a growing mismatch between the timing of the reproduction of caribou and the growth of forage vegeta vegetation needed on their calving grounds. This is contributing to a decline in our caribou populations. Again, not only causing biological implications, but also implications for our own populations that rely on those herds. In concluding, as the report highlights rightly, we can try to help nature adapt with restoration and protection measures. Yes, climate change is happening and our future is increasingly blurry as a result. Canada lends its whole support to UNEP for the critical role that they play in leading the global environmental agenda. The key is slowing the rate of climate change, among other things. And for that, significant greenhouse gas emissions are, reductions are needed urgently. Congratulations on the launch of this report, and thank you for allowing me
to be a speaker today. Thank you very much, Excellency, for that, uh, for your, those brief remarks. Uh, we were due to have the ambassador to, um, to Kenya, the Egyptian ambassador to Kenya, but I think that there is some trouble with the connection. So what I will do is jump straight to the presentation, Martin. If the ambassador is able to join, we shall bring him in after the presentation. Martin, are you ready to go? Yes, thank you, uh, Keisha. And uh, just for the production side, if Carlotta can get in touch with the Egyptian embassy to ensure the connection, thank you. Um, pleasure to be here, thank you all. Uh, the 2022 edition of the Frontiers uh, report titled uh, Noise, Blazes and Mismatches assesses three key environmental issues of concern. Uh, these three issues are among many that have been identified by our network of scientists, experts and institutions across the world. Emerging issues that most probably will have a significant impact on the environment, on the economy and above all on our human society. Without the contributions of these renowned scientific experts and authors, this new Frontiers report would not see the light today. Now, we launched the report in the run-up to the second part of the fifth session of the UN Environment Assembly happening in 10 days from now. In the next few slides, I will present the key findings of the report on each of the three issues addressed. The first environmental issue that the report tackles is discussed in the next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, this is about noise pollution. Uh, recent research has revealed long-term exposure to noise pollution causes mental and physical health problems in humans across all age groups. It is a major and growing environmental issue that requires the attention of policymakers in multiple sectors of society, including the health, transport, and building sectors. To give you just one example, long-term exposure to noise in Europe, for instance, contributes to at least 12,000 premature deaths per year and almost 50,000 new cases of, of ischemic heart disease annually. Now, in many big cities in the global north and south, people are exposed daily to high levels of noise. Some examples are Barcelona, Cairo, Ho Chi Minh City, Hong Kong, New York, Toronto, Nairobi, Jakarta. In a number of cities, studies discovered that high noise levels disrupt the communication by sounds that urban animals rely on for their survival. Examples are the songs and the calls of birds, frogs, and insects. A study in Bogota, Colombia, for instance, found that sparrows in city parks change their singing behavior in anticipation of the morning rush hour by starting to sing earlier and avoid the acoustic interference from traffic noise. Let's go to the next slide. To tackle the issue of noise pollution, we must improve the management of our so-called townscapes. There's a multitude of strategies that city planners and others should focus on. One is the establishment of vegetation belts in urban environments, as they absorb acoustic energy and diffuses noise. Belts of trees and shrubs can serve as green walls that hamper the spread of undesirable noise, while they would amplify natural sounds by attracting wildlife. And the same applies to green roofs. In fact, green spaces such as courtyards and quiet urban parks can offer relief from noisy places and benefit our mental well-being. Indirect measures include reducing driving space in cities by increasing the amount of cycle lanes. This measure can reduce road traffic noise significantly, as has been seen in historic urban centers such as Amsterdam. Furthermore, promoting electric mobility will both reduce noise and improve air quality in urban areas. Going forward, it is important to focus less on noise mitigation and more on planning for desirable soundscapes. In this way, noise pollution can be prevented and benefit people and nature in urban settings in early stages. Now, let me go to the second issue of the report in the next slide, please. This next issue 
concerns wildfires. We know very well that wildfires form a natural component of the Earth's dynamics. Wildfires have always existed since prehistoric times. However, today wildfires are becoming more intense and severe and occur more frequently. This is due to modern climate change and disturbance caused by humans in today's Anthropocene. Research has revealed that climate change related extreme weather events may trigger droughts accompanied by higher temperatures. These originate in many ecosystems, a longer fire season, and therefore increases the chances of fire weather conditions. Subsequently, these start to occur more frequently, raising the probability of more intense, more severe and longer wildfires with all the negative consequences for people and nature. During recent times, human interactions with nature have interfered most strongly with natural fire regimes. Activities such as land clearing deforestation, agricultural expansion, the introduction of invasive species, urban sprawl, rural development, and inappropriate fire management have all led to disturbed natural fire regimes. As a result, these altered fire regimes lack balance and put in jeopardy the health and integrity of both natural and human dominated ecosystems and landscape. We have seen over the past years how large wildfires have destructive consequences for people, their homes, property, and the environment. Examples of disasters caused by wildfires are available from a multiple series of countries, Algeria, Australia, Italy, Greece, Spain, Turkey, Russia, and the United States, and many others. At the same time, these wildfires emit substantial amounts of pollutants, taking into account black carbon, particulate matter, but also greenhouse gases, which take their toll on human health across all ages. And these pollutants contaminate fresh water and oceans, leading to ocean fertilization, and subsequent biodiversity loss. Let's go to the next slide. Now to manage wildfires more successfully, we must take measures that would prevent them from becoming uncontrollable. Measures that focus on prevention are more, most effective. In this way, emphasis should be on improving fire management planning, policies and practices, focusing on strengthening firefighting capacities and build community resilience programs that incorporate preparedness approaches. Also, we should enhance long-term cooperation among different stakeholders in different regions and countries, especially among governments and civil society organizations. The full engagement and involvement of vulnerable groups, such as rural communities, is essential and should be ensured during all stages of preparedness and response. Now going forward, it is of utmost importance to better appreciate and incorporate indigenous fire management techniques, such as prescribed burnings. These techniques ensure that fuel, such as dry litter, is burned under controlled circumstances to reduce the amount of fuel in an ecosystem and hence reduce the chances of large wildfires. Other modern tools that should be integrated into effective fire management include long-range weather forecasting, geographic information systems, including remote sensing and satellite imagery, ground-based radar systems, lightning detection systems, and proactive monitoring of wildfire-prone ecosystems. So with that, I would like to move to the next slide and discuss the third and last issue of the report. This last issue is about phenological shifts. In the next slide, please. Timing is everything for ecosystem harmony. The science of phenology examines the timing of recurring life stages driven by environmental forces and how interacting species respond to changes in time due to these factors. For example, when spring arrives in the Northern hemispheres, Birds start to breed and leaves start to flush. Plants start to flower. Then in autumn in temperate regions, trees shed their, their leaves 
and seeds are dropped and dispersed and birds start to migrate again to warmer regions. Now, due to modern climate change, the timing of these events is changing, disrupting food webs and affecting e ecosystem health and integrity. Ultimately, these phenological shifts lead to significant biodiversity loss. Decades of global warming are now causing shifts in the timing of these life stages of interacting species, resulting in so-called phenological mismatches and ecosystem disruption. Nowadays, scientists have detected phenological shifts in many life cycle events, ranging from reproduction to migration and from leaving to flowering and fruiting. This is truly a global problem affecting plant and animal species in mountains, oceans, tropical and temperate forests and polar regions. And the current rate of human induced climate change is accelerating so fast that many plant and animal species are not able to adapt in a timely manner, which is resulting in a reduction of their population sizes and health. Today, even phenological shifts that have been observed in crops and commercially important species, uh, both uh, fish stocks and agricultural uh, vegetables and fruits, this is very important. This could have said that this could have significant consequences for our food production and global economy. Just think about plant pollinator mismatches happening in agricultural fields affecting harvests. Next slide, please. So what can we do to repair these multiple phenological mismatches? We need to restore habitats and conserve biodiversity. We need to build biological corridors that enhance ecological connectivity and genetic diversity. Researchers have revealed that the more genetic diversity a species has, the greater the chance it can successfully adapt to the changing climate. So species can avoid phenological mismatches and food web disruptions because the maintenance of ecological integrity and habitat connectivity is vital to the survival of species. Therefore, a very important measure that governments can take in collaboration with their partners is to amplify protected area boundaries as the ranges of plant and animal species shift. And it would help strengthen their adaptive capacity. In the end, we have to recognize that the only way to effectively reduce the negative effect of mismatched shifts in phenological events worldwide is actually, actually to rapidly reduce carbon emissions and reduce climate change and global warming. Next slide, please. With that, I would like to thank you on behalf of the uh, unit production team who uh, worked uh, with uh, many authors across the world to produce this uh, first uh, report this year, Frontiers 2022 on noise blazes and mismatches. Thank you so much. Thank you for your attention. Back to you, uh, moderator Keisha. Thank you. Thanks very much, Martin, for that really informative uh, presentation. Um, I understand that we now have uh, the Egyptian ambassador on the line, so I would like to offer him uh, the chance to speak at the moment. This is um, His Excellency, Mr. Khalid Sami Al Abiyad, who is the ambassador of Egypt to Kenya. Welcome, sir. Thank, thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to attend this occasion. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to acknowledge the presence of Mr. David De Silva, the Acting High Commissioner of uh, Canada, uh, Mrs. Andre Hinwood, the UNEP uh, Chief Scientist. Uh, all uh, those are present, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I also would like to thank Mr. Uh, Capella for uh, uh, his presentation. Unfortunately, I was unable to listen to the first part of it. But uh, definitely the part that I listened to was extremely interesting. Um, it's definitely my great pleasure to join you all today for the launch event of UNEP's latest Frontiers Report 2022 edition entitled Noise, Blazes and Mismatches. The science policy work of UNEP is undoubtedly at the very heart of this program's role. And it is reports such as these which help push the envelope of scientific research and shed light on emerging environmental challenges and ultimately serve to inspire informed decision and policy making for member states. It is worth noting that in 
the 2016 edition of UNEP's Frontiers Report, the issue of zoonotic diseases was identified as a key emerging issue of global concern. Several years before the world was ravaged by the COVID-19 pandemic. In the chapter on zoonoses, UNEP highlighted how closely interlinked human and ecosystem health are a lesson which I believe we have all taken to heart. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in this latest edition of the Frontiers Report, UNEP has identified how, in an increasingly urbanizing world, the adverse effects of noise on public health and ecosystems health are a serious and growing global concern. This is yet another emerging challenge which warrants our attention and indeed our action. The report has identified the inherent limitations of using a reactive rather than a proactive approach to address the challenges of noise pollution in urban settings. In this context, I'm pleased to share Egypt's positive experiences in integrating comprehensive environmental planning practices into urban planning for new cities and neighborhoods. Egypt is an ancient civilization, as you all know, but paradoxically, it is also a young, vibrant, and a growing country, and we have set out ambitious plans for the establishment of a new, sustainable, future-proof cities, including a new state-of-the-art administrative capital. These plans have integrated the concepts of soundscape designs espoused by this report into the planning of new cities by including sound barriers on major roads and highways, adequate urban spacing, dedicated bicycle lanes, urban green spaces, and vegetation, as well as regulations for air, air conditioning units to limit their disturbance. Our Ministry of Environment has also been empowered through an ambitious national plan that brings on board all other relevant ministries to address noise pollution concerns in existing urban environments. This has included the inter integration of sound monitoring capabilities in the wide network of air quality monitoring stations across Egypt, requirements for environmental impact assessments, which include noise assessments for all industrial, commercial, touristic, health, educational, and recreational establishments, and the implementation of stricter follow-up and enforcement measures for all of the above. Noise pollution is undoubtedly a challenge for a highly urbanized, densely, popula densely population country the size of Egypt. We continue to take strides to improve the situation and have set out ambitious strategies and plans to address all environmental, social, and economic challenges in a holistic manner through Egypt's Vision 2030 strategy. I thank you. Lucia, thanks, Excellency. Thanks for that. I'm very glad that you were able to join the call. Uh, we will therefore uh, wrap up our speakers for now and move straight to into the Q&A. Uh, we already have a number of questions. So I will uh, launch into the very first one, which is on Brazil. It's rather a long one. So do give me a little time to, to read it through. Um, this is from Mariana. Mariana with CBN in Brazil, and she asks, um, Brazil is responsible for the largest part of the Amazon forest, which has shown record wildfires since 2019, most of these illegal. Last year, around 13,200 square kilometers of forest were cleared up, an increase of 22% compared to 2020. Alongside that, mining is increasing, contaminated even indigenous lands. What are the consequences for the whole world of that destruction and how can other nations contribute to save the forest? Do you believe Brazil's government is doing enough? So I think we'll, we'll, we'll ask two people to respond to this, maybe Andrea first, and then we have a Brazilian colleague who was involved in the report called Livia. So please be on standby to contribute. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Keisha. Um, thanks for the question. I think all governments and all countries need to consider their environmental impacts. And they all certainly need to consider the multiple activities which impact on our ecosystems and biodiversity and subsequently health. 
all of the actions that we can take globally will make a difference in terms of protecting resilience of our ecosystems and ultimately protecting us because we're protecting against climate change or we're mitigating against climate change. But we're also providing a buffer for other environmental issues. So globally, we do, this is exactly what we work towards, which is to end up with global agreements where we can protect the environment so that we can protect biodiversity, human health, our economies are tied up here as well. So I guess I would argue that we need to pay attention to this wherever we are. And uh, perhaps I'll hand that over to Livia. Thanks. Hi, thank you. Uh, we have to admit that there is a lot to be done uh, to guarantee the survival and sustainability of Amazonia. Unfortunately, uh, the deforestation of the Amazon and other very important and significant biomes, such as the Cerrado, are increasing in a certain speed that we might not be able to go back and the losses will be too big even to estimate losses. Uh, by recognizing important sustainable technologies from traditional and indigenous communities all around the world, um, including in Brazil, is the right way to go once they have developed ways of living that have proven to help wildlife conservation. Um, the world and ourselves need to consider the multiple impacts and help to reduce uh, the rates to enable resilience wherever we are. Despite the unfavorable situation in the country, many non-governmental organizations, private and local public environmental institutions, including research institutions worldwide, are working very hard to hold back the deforestation rate and prevent wildfires. We have passed through many governments and we will certainly learn a lot from the experience and hopefully improve for a near future. With international support from the European Union and cooperation funds and agencies from many developed countries, non-governmental institutions and other private and public local institutions, um, such as the, Soci the Institute Society, Population and Nature, are receiving more resources to support the local communities and to conserve nature in Brazil. So this is helping to achieve positive uh, results. Thank you. Thank you very much, Livia. So we'll move on to uh, our next question, which is from uh, Catherine, uh, uh, which is from Richard Jordan, senior international correspondent for us, Congress Web TV, who says, uh, has there been any work in linking the new urban agenda to the positive soundscapes? This would be for the author of the, um, the urban soundscapes, no noise pollution. Francesco, are you on the, on the line? Francesco um, Aletta. Yes, I'm here. Thank you for, for the question. Um, I responded live in the chat, and uh, but I confirm. To my knowledge, um, um, the, um, the NUA does um, refer to the need um, for cities to reduce noise levels um, for improved well-being and quality of life, but it doesn't explicitly acknowledge um, the benefits, the potential benefits of um, positive soundscapes. And uh, that's why I actually think that this uh, chapter, this report is an important, uh, by UNEP, is an important step in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. Um, we have a question for um, Ambassador De Silva. This is from uh, Ra uh, Radio Canada. Bonjour de Montreal. I have a question for uh, Mr. David De Silva. What is the scope of the report for Canada? And can you talk about noise in Canadian cities? And uh, she requests that you please answer in French. Sure, so I'll, I'll answer in English first and then I'll answer in French. Uh, so the, the report was just launched today. I've, I've only had a brief glance at it. I know there is some information on noise um, for Toronto, but noise is a problem that affects um, all Canadian cities at, at all levels, as it does all urban developments um, around the world. Uh, this is a particularly sensitive month for Canada and noise uh, because of very noisy protests that are going on in our cities. But, but this report looks more globally at, at the larger issues of noise. Um, in, in the report, there was information uh, for Toronto, for example, that looked at two 15-year-long studies of long-term residents of Toronto and found that exposure to road traffic noise 
caused higher risks of heart attack and heart failure and increased uh, diabetes and hypertension. So it really shows that the complexity of these issues are, are sometimes obvious in the short term, but not necessarily so obvious in the long, long term. And with, with science and, and quality research that comes out. I'll repeat the answer in, in French. Uh, pour moi, uh, je n'ai pas d'information dans le rapport qui disent, uh, qui disent des informations sur les, les villes comme Montréal, mais j'ai vu que le rapport a de l'information sur, sur Toronto, uh, ma ville natale, par exemple. Uh, il dit uh, dans le rapport qu'il qu y avait deux études de, de 15 ans sur des résidents de longue durée de Toronto qui, uh, qui ont constaté que l'exposition au bruit de la circulation routière a causé des risques élevés, des crises cardiaques, et de l'insuffisance cardiaque congestive et a augmenté aussi à l'incidence de diabète de 8 de 8 et aussi l'hypertension de, de 2 Alors, euh, c'est-à-dire que même s'il si, euh, y a des effets euh, instant, instantanés euh, de, de court terme euh, avec le bruit pour la population locale, euh, il y a aussi des, des effets plus cachés euh, qui, qui, qui sont dévoilés dans le long terme euh, avec la recherche. Alors, ça, c'est l'importance de, de ce type de recherche et de, de, de ce type de publication, qu'on qu peut avoir une, une meilleure connaissance et compréhension des, des effets euh, du bruit dans nos, dans nos villes sur nos, nos populations. Thank you very much, Excellency. Uh, we have uh, one question here from Catherine Early from China Dialogue, which says, in what ways does the draft global biodiversity framework take the need to act to delay phenological changes into account. Um, I think, Martin, I can pass this one to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Keisha. This is really an important question, uh, particularly because, you know, climate change is uh, projected to be a rapidly increasing uh, additional driver for biodiversity loss. So since climate change and biodiversity loss impact societies everywhere, you know, we do need both solutions that require an integration of environmental and, and societal objectives. So, you know, uh, so far, most existing international biodiversity targets have overlooked climate change impacts, um, but that is changing. Uh, you know, climate change mitigation measures, for instance, uh, can also harm biodiversity. So, so the conventional biological diversity post 2020 uh, framework, the global biodiversity framework offers the opportunity now to address the interactions between climate change and biodiversity. So uh, phenological uh, mismatches that we are discussing here could be taken into account in order to ensure that we really, uh, you know, get biodiversity targets uh, that align better to also uh, the UNFCCC uh, Climate Change Convention and the Paris Agreement and, uh, you know, and the Sustainable Development Goals. So there's an opportunity here to, to work on that going, uh, going uh, forward. Thank you. I hope that uh, answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, we have one question from Lesotho. This is from Mola Mpesi, and this is on wildfires. So perhaps Martin, and we also, we also have Andrew Dowdy, one of the authors on, on the line, so he could help. Uh, is it advisable to burn grass in order to have an improved rangeland? It's common practice in my country, in Lesotho, for shepherds to burn the grass. Uh, this, I think, is uh, maybe one for Andrew or Martin. Uh, let's uh, give Andrew the floor. I can uh, happy to compliment. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the report covers some of the practices that can help uh, reduce risks of wildfires, including in a changing climate. And in particular, it notes that a lot of the traditional practices around fire management um, can be considered in an integrated approach with the environmental impacts of fires. And so in particular, the report notes that as climate change is making the fire weather and um, conditions for dangerous fires worse, our practices and policies and on the ground approaches to managing the wildfires needs to improve and enhance at a rate that keeps up with how climate change is making the risks greater. So um, traditional practices are part of that integrated um, management solutions that we note in the report going forwards. Martin, you're, you're muted, thanks. Thank you. If I may compliment, uh, thank 
you, uh, Andrew, for those points. Yeah, just to add, perhaps. Uh, so, so the report is about uh, you know prescribed burning techniques that can be part of those integrated approaches. So that is really focusing here on avoiding those and preventing those bigger uh, wildfires. So uh, uh, there could be, of course, co-benefits in terms of improving uh, soils in those areas uh, where uh, grass is burnt in Rageland. But of course, that will also have other impacts on ecosystems and that would need to be assessed to better understand uh, you know are there also uh, trade-offs so this is really about co-benefits versus trade-offs uh, but again as Dr. Dowdy said it is really about coming up with integrated management systems and approaches where the prescribed burning uh, becomes part of that broader set of goals which could be uh, you know including both the uh, avoidance of wildfires uh, as well as uh, improving, uh, you know, uh, conditions for agriculture, but it has to be seen in an integrated way. Thank you. Back to you, Keisha. Thanks very much, uh, Martin and Andrew. We have a question from Tanzania. This is from Minzilet Ijai. For, no, sorry, this is from Kenya. Minzilet Ijai from Radio France International Kiswahili. Uh, the question is: uh, How is UNEP engaging government in establishing policies to look into noise pollution in ur urban areas? I would say this would be one for Andrea or Martin, or both. Perhaps okay. Andrea. Yes, so part of this report is actually to highlight the issue of noise because a lot of, a lot of governments are not thinking about noise. The types of um, sources of noise, such as industry or traffic or rail, they're not necessarily thinking about planning effectively to actually separate sources of noise to protect human health, and they're certainly not necessarily considering it in terms of species that may re reside in particular locations. So part of this report is for us to now go out and say, hey, governments around the world, noise is a significant issue that you now need to take account of. And of course, we will be working with some of those solutions. The solutions, uh, unfortunately, not one size fits all. There will be different locations, different planning regimes, different types of cities that require different um, solutions. And so I think this is now the conversation that we need to have about what are the appropriate solutions for a given city and what sorts of things can we put in place? It's actually a pretty exciting place to start though, because many of the actions you would take will improve greening, will improve walkability, will, Im will change um, traffic and emissions profiles, which will also help protect in terms of human health from air pollution. So I think this is a really positive uh, step that we can all take. So thanks for the question. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, we will move on to the next question, which is from Daniela Chiaretti in Brazil. And she says, uh, just a clarification about the world wildfires. Does the report make a difference between natural wildfires and those caused by human activities? And I think I'll go to Martin and Andrew. Perhaps only one of you needs to take that. Yes, uh, thank you, Keisha. Actually, I would like to defer directly to Dr. Dowdy, who's the specialist on the topic. Andrew, please. So the report makes it clear that human-caused climate change is exacerbating the risk factors for dangerous wildfires, and that includes whether they're ignited by humans or ignited by natural sources like lightning. So things like the increased temperatures um, can affect the relative humidity of the air that can dry out the, um, the fuels and make them more available to burn. So when a natural cause like lightning ignites the fuels, there's a higher chance that they may grow and develop into a large fire. And similarly for a human caused fire, that um, human caused fire, fire ignition, um, similar case, if, if climate change, as we see from, it, from the results and the data and the science, that it's making it more dangerous weather conditions, it doesn't really matter whether it's been ignited by humans or lightning, there's still that increased risk of it growing into a large and dangerous um, fire. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, we have one from Rachel Ndwati, Egaton Radio in Kenya, who says, does the report cover solutions, how solutions can be localized to individual countries and then even further localized, you know, 
down to devolved systems. And perhaps again, that might be one for um, Martin or Andrea. Thank you, uh, Keisha, and uh, happy to give uh, the, the floor to Andrea shortly. Uh, yes, the uh, report comes up with uh, recommendations uh, with uh, policy options that can inform uh, solutions and action on the ground. Uh, of course, uh, we all know that uh, every country, every region, uh, every area has its own properties and will need to be looked at uh, you know, in terms of uh, local conditions, and it may differ from one place to another. So you cannot just apply, you know, across the board uh, around the globe, uh, all the solutions in the same manner, you will need to adapt them to the, the local conditions. But yes, the report does offer solutions, uh, you know, in, in a general fashion based on the, the latest science. Uh, so uh, yes, the, the, the answer is in general, yes, but you need to localize it uh, to make it, uh, uh, let's say, feasible uh, on the ground in the particular place that you uh, live or work. In. Uh, over to Andrea for further comments. Yeah, I would agree with Martin in, in that response. And indeed, what we're asking uh, is that we start to plan for these issues. And so adapting solutions in a given location that are going to be relevant because there will be different sources of noise. There will be different species that are experiencing phenological shifts, etc. And so, as I say, one size does not fit all, so it has to be made relevant to the particular location. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a couple of other questions, but they are not strictly speaking about this report. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the gentleman from Lesotho, I saw, I saw that you have a question about uh, vehicles polluting cities, which is something we can answer offline because we do have, um, we have some research on that as well. So I think um, I'm quite happy to sort of wrap it up here. And thanks very much to the panelists for your time. Thanks very much to the media for uh, giving us this time of yours. Uh, we will have, as, as I mentioned, the UN Environment Assembly starting in the next couple of uh, weeks. So please look out for information on that. And if you have any questions following on this, do get in touch with me and my team, Keisha Rukikaire. We should have contact details available, and uh, have a good afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thanks so much for the invitation yeah. and fantastic yeah. report. It's gorgeous. No, that was, that was fantastic to actually get your remarks, and thanks to our our, our authors as well who are here. And I, I think, uh, no, our Egypt representative's gone as well. Anyway, nice to meet you. Thanks everyone. Nice to meet you too. Thanks so much. Have a great afternoon. Take See care. Ya. Thank Bye. you. All the best. Bye-bye.